So our viewers and listeners will back uh, from that commercial break. So I was still trying to take you through some of the political aspects that led to the colonization of Africa. But of course, um, we will not only focus on that. There are quite uh, a number of other factors that we can talk about that led to colonization of Africa, some of which were philanthropic factors. Philanthropic factors. If you don't say philanthropic, you can refer to them as social factors or humanitarian factors. So never be derived. Eh, when you come across a question like, to what extent did the philanthropism lead to the colonization of Africa? Philanthropism simply means social or humanitarian factors. So these were quite a number, like the need to spread Christianity, the need to spread Christianity. Um, we have factors like the need to end or abolish slave trade, need to end slave trade. We can also talk about the need to settle the surplus population. Settle the surplus. The surplus population. We can also talk about the need to end the barbaric practices of the Africans. Need to end, end the barbaric practices of the Africans. Practices of the Africans. Of course, these included uh, human sacrifice, uh, aspects like um, murder of twins, and this was so prominent amongst the Igbo people and Yoruba in West Africa. Okay. Uh -huh. Then they need to outcompete Islam, as you are aware. Uh, Islam was the first alien religion to come in Africa, and indeed it had a very strong footing in West Africa. And indeed, because it had a very strong footing, when Christianity set in, there was a huge competition for converts, okay? between Islam and Christianity, and indeed that eventually tantamounted or compounded into the 19th century jihads, which jihads, I do believe, you must have covered with your teachers, wherever you are, under the turbulent period. So, the need to outcompete Islam. Islam was really a big challenge. It gave the Christian missionaries a run for their money in West Africa, okay? Uh -huh. Then we can also say the need to promote formal education, okay? from education, and so on and so forth. When it comes to economic factors, I always inform and tell my students that uh, economic factors in general are nine. If you want, you can say ten. Okay, So we can refer to them as economic factors or commercial considerations or Hobson's views. Why do we refer to them as Hobson's views? Because these ideas were put forward by uh, a scholar known as Hobson. Hobson went ahead and argued that the colonization of Africa was purely as a result of economic or commercial considerations. So, if you ever come across a question that says that to what extent did Hobson's views lead to the colonization of Africa, uh, it is basically calling for the extent to which economic factors or commercial factors led to the colonization of Africa. And of course, under this, we have the common seven effects of the industrial revolution effects of the industrial revolution ladies and gentlemen here you should know that it was not the industrial revolution per se that led to the colonization of africa but the after effects of the industrial revolution is what actually led to the colonization of africa what was industrial revolution all about it was to do with scientific and geographical uh, research and advancement that took place scientific and technological, non geographical, scientific and technological advancement that characterized the European powers. And as all of us are aware, industrialization first reached its climax in Britain, but of course it spread all over Europe. And indeed, industrial uh, revolution or industrialization came along with quite a number of issues, some of which developed into challenges, which challenges had to be addressed by the European powers. So, it was not the Industrial Revolution that led to the colonization, but it was the after effects of the Industrial Revolution that resulted into the colonization of Africa. And among these included, 
Industrial Revolution created unemployment. And therefore, it was the responsibility of the European powers to look for employment opportunities for their respective people or personnel. Because with the use of machines, it meant that human beings became as good as useless. So the work that was initially being done by human beings was now being done by machines. And therefore, what did result into? Unemployment. But of course, with unemployment or increased unemployment, it meant that there were possibilities of an increase eh, in the crime rate. And of course, to avert that, the onus was on the European governments then to ensure that they provided something productive that could be done by their respective citizens. So, and that alternative was only to be found elsewhere. And of course, Africa could not survive. And thus, colonization. Number two, there was dumping. Dumping came about because of excessive production. When we talk about dumping, we are not referring to the usual dumping that these days the teens use. You know, I was dumped and so on and so forth. We are talking about dumping of economics that came about as a result of excessive production. With excessive production, it meant that more was being produced and therefore supply was more than demand. But of course, the European powers could not just sit back and watch as they were operating on losses. They would rather sell the surplus products at relatively lower prices elsewhere. And indeed, they had to look for market for the excessive produce. And of course, Africa could not survive. Three, need for market. Need for market. Because of the improvement in the quantity and the quality of what was being produced. And of course, the improvement in the quality and the quantity came about because of use of machines. Use of machines came about because of industrial revolution. I'll keep on referring to the effects of the Industrial Revolution. That's why I said it was not the Industrial Revolution per se that led to the colonization, but it was rather the after effects of the Industrial Revolution. So need for market. So a lot was produced, the quality had improved, the quantity had increased, but of course, not everything that had been produced could be consumed in Europe. So they had to come to Africa. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Africa now was being viewed as a workshop for the European powers. Then, the need for raw materials. Industrial revolution created the need for raw materials. Why the need for raw materials? Because they needed to produce finished goods, but they did not have the resources. Why? Because their climate would not permit them to do so. And because of that, they had to look for other areas where they could able to acquire raw materials or resources such as cotton, such as coffee, such as rubber, eh? such as palm oil, that could be used in the production of finished goods. And of course, Africa had a relatively good climate that could permit the growth of these resources, which would eventually be used as raw materials. And since it was now survival for the fittest, there was no way Africa could survive. But of course, rather, European powers had to compete, they had to struggle to take over the African continent so as to locate areas where they would get raw materials. And indeed when they came, they emphasized the growing of these so-called cash crops. Why were they being regarded as cash crops? Because after the Africans cultivated those resources, they used to sell these resources to, to the Europeans. Though um, the prices were always being determined by the Europeans. Of course, uh, you would understand that better under uh, colonial economy. Then we can also talk about the need to invest surplus capital. Invest surplus, surplus capital. The need to invest the surplus capital. The need to invest the surplus capital came about because of the massive sales. The massive sales came about because of the improvement in quality and quantity of the products. And therefore, with that, what happened? The Europeans acquired abnormal profits. Now I'm bringing in economics. The Europeans accrued abnormal profits. And with the abnormal profits, of course, back at home, they were already developed. And therefore, they were looking for other possible alternative areas where they would reinvest the surplus capital in terms of establishment of industries, processing industries preferably, in terms of establishment of factories, in terms of schools, in terms of roads, and so on and so forth. So, 
Because by then, Africa was so backward and poor, it provided a vagging area where surplus capital would be reinvested. Okay? Then, we can also talk about um, the increase in population. I presented population under philanthropism or humanitarian reasons. But I'm also bringing it back under uh, one of the effects of the Industrial Revolution. With the Industrial Revolution, we will say there was surplus capital. Which surplus capital came about because of the improvement in the quality and quantity of commodities, which attracted massive sales. With the massive sales, what did it imply? It meant that the social welfare of the people improved. And with the improvement in the social welfare of the people, what did it imply? There was a significant reduction in the mortality rate, a significant reduction in the death rate. So it meant that the number of people steadily increased, whereas the land as a resource remained fixed. Now, with the land as a resource remaining fixed, it meant that there was a pressure on the land, and the land as a resource became scarce. Ladies and gentlemen, it was the responsibility and honor of the European governments to find alternative places where the surplus population would be settled, which surplus population came about because of the improvement in the social welfare of the people, which improvement in the social welfare of the people came about because of acquisition of abnormal profits, which abnormal profits came about because of massive production and massive sales, which massive sales came about because of the improvement and increase in the quality and the quantity of the commodities. Are we together? Hope we are there. Okay. Now, those are some of the effects of the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. that led to the colonization of Africa. But we can also add on other economic aspects like one, the discovery of minerals. The discovery of minerals. The discovery of minerals. Our focus is on which minerals? Of course, the most outstanding was diamond that was discovered in 1867 or 68 at Kimberley. At Kimberley. Then we also had gold that was discovered in 1886 at Whitwater's Rand. These minerals had been discovered in South Africa. Okay? in South Africa. Now, with the discovery of these major minerals, European powers eventually developed an insight that probably the whole of Africa was full of minerals. And that was the beginning of survival for the fittest. European powers started getting anywhere in anticipation of uh, discovering more minerals. And of course, we cannot forget copper, which was also discovered in the Katanga region. Katanga region. Eh? In the Congo, okay, which is present in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, okay. So these minerals eventually gave a false hope and confidence to European powers to continue eh, um, looking for more areas in anticipation of getting more of these minerals, okay. So discover of minerals. We can also say we can also add on another factor, and that is to say role of chartered companies. These were initially private companies that had been granted charters by their respective European powers to operate on their behalf. And because they were granted charters, that is why they came to be known as chartered companies. There were quite a number in Africa. Uh, in East Africa, there were basically two outstanding companies. We can talk about the Imperial British East African Company. That was a representation of the British in Kenya and Uganda, being led by William Macnon. Uh -huh. We can also make a mention of the Giaco, Giaco, which operated in Tanganyika, being led by Carl Peters. Okay. Then, in other areas, for example, in South and Central Africa, we had the British South African Company, the British South African Company, and... Uh, John Cecil Rhodes, 
John Cecil Rhodes, okay, operating on behalf of the British. And in West Africa, we had the Royal Niger, the Royal Niger Company, eh, operating under George Tubman Goldie. George Tubman Goldie, okay. George Tubman Goldie, okay. Now, these companies were granted charters to operate on behalf of their respective home governments or home countries. And indeed, these countries, I mean, these companies went ahead and monopolized the trade on behalf of their respective home governments. Some of these companies actually participated in direct administration of the spheres of influence of their respective home governments. Some of these countries went ahead and even suppressed resistances and rebellions because some of them were very organized to the extent of even possessing forces. A case in point was the Royal Niger Company. That had the Niger Frontier Police Force. Okay, Ibeako was also key. It also had forces being led by Frederick, Frederick Lugard, and so on and so forth. And then we can also add on the economic depression. Economic depression. Economic depression. We are not talking about the world or the great economic depression of European history, okay, of 1920, 1929 to 33, okay. We are talking about the economic depression of 1872 to 79. And of course, this was the time when there was nothing moving on economically or in terms of business in European powers. No profits being made, okay? Uh, losses were the order of the day. Inflation, okay? No visible investments, and so on and so forth. And of course, in order to change the situation, then European powers um, had to do something. And of course, Africa provided the alternative. Africa provided the alternative. Now, um, there are some other factors that at times... I add on reluctantly, such as the need to monopolize trade. But of course, when you talk about the issue of the need to monopolize trade, and you've talked about chartered companies, you may ignore it. Otherwise, some learners make a mistake of uh, quoting an example of the Indian Ocean trade. I don't know whether the Indian Ocean trade was worth being scrambled for by the European powers and so on and so forth. At times, students quote, Long distance trade in East and Central Africa. Long distance trade true existed, but I don't know how profitable it was more so on the side of the European powers and to the extent of making them to come and take over. Okay? Sometimes some students quote that um, also uh, the, 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 the Trans Saharan trade in West Africa, but it was so ancient then, and I don't think we can make a mention of it, and so on and so forth. Now, there are also other factors, okay, that can uh, be regarded as, um, as um, strategic, strategic, strategic factors. Our dear viewers and listeners, if you are to understand ably what the word strategic means, then you'll be in position to understand how strategic factors resulted only to the colonization of Africa. Strategic simply means value added. For example, you might be at home watching us here on Delta TV, but you've chosen to sit in an area or a place that you choose or that you think is going to be comfortable for you to watch this program so that you're not being disturbed. Where you are seated is the strategic place. And what you are benefiting right now, the program that you're watching, okay, is the factor. The area that you're watching from is the strategic place. Anything strategic should be in position to add value, okay, to add value. Some of you might be watching from your bedrooms simply because you want to be very, very attentive and you don't want any disturbance. So your bedroom becomes the strategic place, okay? And whatever you're benefiting as you're watching from there becomes the factor. So if you're to understand strategic factor, ladies and gentlemen, you should be in position to identify an area, the, okay? An area, okay? show how it was important how it was important 
And then, to who? To who? Okay? By that, you would be in position to clearly understand how the strategic factors can be used to explain the phenomenon of scramble and partition. At the end of the day, you realize that anything strategic had an economic connotation. At the end of the day, you realize that we did not actually have any strategic factor as far as colonization was concerned. Because whatever area that possessed a strategic importance had an economic attachment or background. And at the end of the day, you realize that you'll be integrating the strategic areas with the economic attachment and then to which European powers that benefited. An example, look at Egypt. You always talk about the Egyptian question as a factor. What made Egypt to be important? Egypt had the Suez Canal. Egypt had the Nile. How important was the Suez Canal and the Nile? The Suez Canal shortened the distance to and from the economic empire of Britain by 4,000 miles. So that made Egypt to be strategic. To which European power? Britain. Okay? To Britain. Okay? The Suez Canal and the Nile. To Britain. Okay? Okay? We'll, we are still trying to look at the first question. We are only trying to show how strategic factors led to the colonization. Okay? We are not yet uh, at question three, how the British vision of Egypt led to the colonization. That is another thing altogether. Now, uh -huh. what else was strategic? Uganda. Uganda was of strategic importance. Why? Because it had the source of the Nile. Source of the Nile. And therefore, to which European power? Britain. Britain was not ready to let any other European power occupy Uganda. Because the occupation of Uganda would mean that Britain had lost the control of the Nile. So them being stationed in Egypt without controlling the Nile from its source would be as good as useless. Okay, so they had to ensure that they occupy Uganda. Now Uganda became a strategic area. Why? Because of Lake Victoria, which was the source of the Nile, and which European power to Britain. Mm -hmm. What else? What else? Kenya can also be presented as a strategic factor, and in this case, Kenya becomes the strategic area. What made Kenya strategic? It provided an outlet to the coastline. Remember, Uganda had its own issues. Uganda was landlocked, and yet the British wanted to participate in trade, okay? So they had to occupy the neighboring country, which was Kenya, okay? So to which European power? To Britain. Also, we can also go ahead and talk about Sudan. What made Sudan to be strategic? There were quite a number of issues that made Sudan to be strategic. First of all, it laid along the Nile Valley. And remember, the British, their interest was controlling the entire Nile Valley. And therefore, it meant that any country along the Nile Valley could not survive for strategic reasons. Because they realized that if they left any country within the Nile Valley unoccupied, then another European power would take advantage of it, and that would disorganize their activities in either Egypt or even in Uganda, okay? So the Nile Valley, but also Sudan had economic resources like coal, there was timber, there was iron, there was cobalt. All of these would be used as resources for the production of finished what? For the production of finished goods. I'm emphasizing the aspect of strategic. Anything strategic should have value attached. Then, even South Africa was of strategic importance because of the minerals, okay? Because of the minerals, okay? Mm -hmm. Minerals here, South Africa, because of the minerals. And remember the minerals that had been discovered earlier on, the diamond and gold that we talked about, had been discovered 
in the areas that were under the control of the Boers, and there was no code relationship between the British and the Boers. For that matter, that gave John Cecil Rhodes, whom we talked about as the leader of the British South African Company, a second thought. He wanted to penetrate inland, okay, with the anticipation of creating a second rand. Second rand simply means he anticipated to find more areas with gold as gold had been discovered in the Witwaters run. And indeed, it was a part of the reasoning, this reasoning, that gave Cecil Rhodes with the insight and the propaganda of trying to paint Africa red by joining the Cape, by joining the Cape to Cairo, okay? So, the logic behind is just identify an area, show how important it was, or what made that area important, and which European power, so that we're in position to complete uh, the strategic sequence. Now, there are some other factors. Of course, we've not exhausted other strategic areas. There were quite a number. Okay, for example, you can also add on the coastal areas of Angra Pequena, okay, which um, became strategic for the Portuguese, okay, and so on and so forth. You can talk about Katanga or Congo. Congo also became strategic, okay, uh, because of uh, copper, okay, and of course it was uh, scrambled for, and that resulted into the Congo crisis, okay, as we'll see later, okay, thank you.